Grace and peace to you from God our Father and from our Lord, our Savior, Jesus Christ. We focus now on the Old Testament reading for this weekend. It takes us back to the days of Elijah the prophet. We're talking the 800s before Christ. And we're going to look at 1 Kings chapter 19, verses 3 through 8. And there it is written, Elijah was afraid and ran for his life. When he came to Beersheba in Judah, he left his servant there while he himself went a day's journey into the wilderness. He came to a broom bush, sat down under it, and prayed that he might die. I've had enough, Lord, he said. Take my life. I'm no better than my ancestors. Then he lay down under the bush and fell asleep. All at once an angel touched him and said, Get up and eat. He looked around, and there by his head was some bread baked over hot coals and a jar of water. He ate and drank and then lay down again. The angel of the Lord came back a second time and touched him and said, Get up and eat, for the journey is too much for you. So he got up and ate and drank. Strengthened by that food, he traveled 40 days and 40 nights until he reached Horeb, the mountain of God. This is the word of the Lord. Have you ever had a bad day? Have you ever had a bad day and thought to yourself, well, tomorrow is going to be better? But tomorrow came, and tomorrow was worse than the day before. And then did you think to yourself, well, maybe tomorrow things will get better. But tomorrow came, and tomorrow was worse than the day before that and the day before that. And then you thought, well, maybe tomorrow, and you get what I'm talking about. And finally, you get to a point where you ask the question, how bad can it get? And we're going to think about that question today as we think about this account from 1 Kings chapter 19, an account from the life and the ministry of Elijah. And and there's, there's a couple things we're going to note. First of all, sometimes things get real bad. They do, don't they? But... Never too bad, because we're going to see the mercy and the ministry of God when it comes to his people, especially as it's exhibited in the life and the ministry of Elijah. Now, when we're talking about Elijah the prophet, as I mentioned, we're we're back in the 800s before Christ. Elijah is a prophet to Israel who lives on the east side of the Jordan River in a place called Gilead. And he was a man who was privileged to see many, many miracles. You know, if you go back and you read all the accounts that deal with Elijah's life and ministry, there was a time where he was out in the wilderness and it was a drought and all the rivers and the wadis should have been pretty much dried up in Israel. But God miraculously made water come forth from a brook. And then he miraculously fed Elijah with food that was delivered by ravens who normally would have eaten the food, right? And then, and then there was a time where he went to a place called Zarephath and he goes to the house of a widow and while he's there he said, uh, you know, make, make me some food. And she said, well, you know, I only have enough uh, meal or flour and oil to make a last meal for my son and me and then we're probably going to die of starvation. And Elijah said, no, go ahead and make that meal. The Lord will take care of you. And after that it was like, you know, the flour, the meal never ran out. The, the oil never ran out. And then it was a little while later that the widow's only son died and God used Elijah as an agent to bring that son back to life. Well, then you can think of, you know, one of the most famous of the miracles in the the life and the ministry of Elijah, the big showdown with the prophets of Baal and Asherah on on Mount Carmel. These were the prophets of idols. And uh, Elijah had said, okay, you make a an altar and you put a sacrifice on it and you call upon your gods to consume it and I'll do the same and I'll call upon my God to consume my sacrifice and so those those false prophets did what they did and nothing happened but Elijah before he called on the Lord doused the altar and the sacrifice with water and then he called on God to consume it with fire and all of a sudden fire came down from heaven and Elijah got to see that well then, right after that, there's a, there's a report about how there had not been rain and there was no evidence there was going to be any rain and all of a sudden the rain miraculously came just seemingly out of nowhere 
And when King Ahab, who was up on that Mount Carmel, along with all those prophets and Elijah, decided it was time to head back down to his capital in Jezreel, he was in his chariot, and I'm sure that uh, in those days this would have been a pretty hot car, and so he could make down the mount pretty fast, but Elijah miraculously runs ahead of the chariot, and I dare say that if that happened today, he probably would have qualified for the Olympics, and he may have even won a gold medal. So Elijah was a man who saw and experienced many, many miracles in his life. But he also was a man who knew misery. And it was right after this account of Mount Carmel where Elijah and the true prophets of God killed 850 false prophets of Baal and Asherah that the report got back to King Ahab's wife, Queen Jezebel, who was just really steeped in her idolatry and was very wicked and, and hated a, um, Elijah, that when she heard about what happened, this was her reaction. And I put Queen Jezebel's name in red because I'm sure she was hot, okay, and with anger, all right. She said, may the gods deal with me, be it ever so severely, if by this time tomorrow I do not make your life like that of one of them, one of those dead prophets. Now I realize the king is probably supreme, but the queen is right behind him in terms of power and authority, and when she puts a contract out on you, it's probably time that you get your affairs in order and you get ready to die. So she makes life miserable for him, for Elijah. But there was also the sinful nature within him that created all kinds of misery. Now, this wasn't the first time that Ahab had been threatened. I mean, that Elijah had been threatened. King Ahab didn't like Elijah, didn't like his message, didn't like the fact that his prophecies weren't in sync with, uh, with uh, King Ahab's PR program. And, and just think about Elijah being up on that Mount Carmel with all those enemies of the true God of Israel and Elijah. And if nothing had happened with that, that altar that was dedicated to the Lord, you can be sure that those those prophets and those followers of those idols would have been dead serious about seeing Elijah seriously dead. And so it's ironic that this man who is so confident and puts so much trust in the Lord suddenly is so afraid and even flees. And isn't it ironic how Elijah also feels like such a failure? He says, I'm no better than my ancestors. The ancestors probably who had, who had been killed because they had, they had preached the word of the Lord and people had risen up and had put them to death. And, and so we're told that Elijah flees. He goes from Jezreel or from that, that mountain. He goes down to Beersheba, which is way down in the south. It's probably about 70 or 80 miles. And then he leaves his servant there, his companion, and he goes out into the wilderness, another day's journey, and he lays down under a broom bush. And, and he wants to die. Just let me die, Lord. I'm no better than my ancestors. I'm a failure. I'm worthless. No good. Now, you know, I think there are a lot of people, myself included, that if the Lord gives me you know, a choice of how I leave. I'd like to go to bed at 10 o'clock and maybe somewhere during the night when I wake up, there I am, I'm seeing Jesus and I'm seeing, you know, my father, mother and so on and I'm in glory and I'm in heaven. Wouldn't that be a nice way to go? Uh, when I ask people over in the, the Oak Hills and Sleepy Eye Care Center and so on, what would you like me to pray for? Quite often they say, pray that the Lord takes me today. Think of the Apostle Paul, where he, as he's writing to the Philippians, says, you know, it'd be better by far to be with Jesus. He says, I know that if I die, wouldn't that be a great thing, because I'll be in heaven. And so there's nothing wrong with that when we think that. But when we come to a point of where we just are ready to give up on life, and we're saying, Lord, now end it today, it's almost like uh, we want to take control, and we want to tell God what to do. And that's what Elijah's sinful nature was doing. It was just giving up when God hadn't given up on Elijah. And sometimes doesn't that happen to us? We too know misery. 
If, if we went around church this morning and we asked everybody, tell me about the most miserable time in life, sermon card, first thing on there, talk about a really bad time in your life if you can. I think we all could, could tell about some really tough times. Times where pain was severe. The, the problems were intense. Maybe the, the, the suffering was long. The depression was deep. And, and it just seemed like nothing was happening. We found ourselves, even like Elijah, we were afraid and, and we felt like running. And sometimes what happens then is our sinful nature rises up. And especially if we, as I talked about in the beginning, think tomorrow and then tomorrow and tomorrow and tomorrow and it doesn't happen. And things are not happening quickly enough and so we begin to become frustrated with God. And we can wonder about God and his love and we can start sitting back and playing God with God and judging him and saying that, uh, you know, God doesn't really know what he's doing because he's letting me suffer in this, this set of circumstances in which I, I find myself. And he doesn't really seem to love me as much as he tells me, and he's not as faithful as he says. It seems like God is lackadaisical, and he's losing sight of things that he should be keeping track with. And there we are, we're violating the first commandment again and again and again, not honoring God as God, but playing God with God. We're sinning. And it seems that Elijah was guilty of doing that also. And it brings us back to that question, how bad can it get? Well, we see sometimes real bad. But when it comes to God and his people, it, it's never too bad because of the mercy and the ministry of God. Now think about Elijah. There he is. He's out in the wilderness. He's just giving up. He's ready to die. But God does not give up on him. All at once an angel touched him and said, get up and eat. And he looked around and there by his head was some bread baked and, and over hot coals and a jar of water. He ate and drank and then lay down again. The angel of the Lord came back a second time and touched him and said, get up and eat for the journey is too much for you. So he got up and ate and drank and strengthened by the food. He traveled 40 days and 40 nights until he reached Horeb, the mountain of God. So Elijah, a man who had seen many miracles before this, now experienced another miracle. We're told in verse 5, an angel of the Lord came and touched him. Now in verse 7 it says that this is the angel of the Lord. You know, sometimes there's a distinction. Uh, you, you know from the Bible that God created angels sometime during creation week, created them as spirits, quick, powerful purposes to serve God. Uh, all of them were initially holy, but part of them rebelled against God and became the evil angels, the demons. The angels are normally invisible, but there are times where they take on a physical form, like when two angels went with the Lord to visit Abraham and Sarah in the plains of Mamre, according to Genesis chapter 18. Or think of the resurrection of Jesus, uh, the angels sitting by or in the empty tomb. So sometimes the angels take on a physical form and they, they appear to people. Now, an angel could be one of these created beings, but when it talks about the angel of the Lord, in many cases in the Old Testament, it's a reference to the Lord himself. And whether you, you make the case that it, it's a created angel or whether it's the Lord himself, the created angels come from the Lord. And so the Lord is, is here showing mercy and ministering to Elijah as all of a sudden an angel touches him. And there's the food. And there's the water. And he eats and he drinks and he goes back to sleep and the angel comes back again and touches him. And there is this miracle that's taking place where God is sending his, his holy messenger, to, the Lord is coming himself and is ministering to Elijah. And while Elijah has given up on life, the Lord has not given up on Elijah. And we see these miracles taking place. But there is a bigger miracle here. And that is the fact that God forgives Elijah and doesn't give up on him. But, but in view of a, a child who would be born in Bethlehem about 800 years later, whose adult body would hang on a cross of Calvary and would suffer and die for the sins of the world and then rise again on the third day, 
God forgave Elijah's sins. The sin with which he was born as well as the sins that his sinful nature caused him to commit in life. And God looked at Elijah still as holy and acceptable in his sight. And so there was a miracle of God's mercy showing itself there and and God then gave Elijah purpose and gave him power to get up from his the depths of his depression, his pits of life, and to get going and to get back on the road again, as we saw in verse 8, where he begins his journey to Horeb, where there God is going to give him some missions that he is supposed to carry out in the name of the Lord. And so God, even though at times he allows things to get really bad, and why does God do that? Well, he does it because he's testing us. He's, He's... He's teaching us things that maybe we wouldn't learn. Sometimes he's making us stop uh, from, from ways of life that are just not good. They're sinful, and he wants to bring us to repentance. Sometimes he's putting us in circumstances that we, we wouldn't go into because he wants us to do something there, to meet somebody, maybe to witness somebody to somebody. But through it, God is with us also making sure that things don't get too bad and, and showing his mercy and doing his ministry. Now, you may say to yourself, well, I don't wake up in the morning and I don't see an angel sitting on the headboard of my bed and, and there's some hot, uh, hot coffee or some freshly squeezed juice and some nice warm bread there that the angel's given me. I've never seen an angel, you might say, and I haven't either as far as I know. But who's to say that you weren't in a hospital bed sometime and it was the middle of the night and you were in extreme pain and all of a sudden this person walks into your room and appears to be a nurse and gives you some medication that takes you out of your misery and you think it's just another person of the nursing staff of that hospital but it could be an angel of God or it could be that the car is broken down there you are you're along the road and uh, there's nothing you can do to get it going again. And all of a sudden, there is this seemingly good Samaritan who stops and goes and gets under the hood and starts tinkering around, and all of a sudden, the car gets going again. And uh, you assume it's just the good Samaritan, but who is to say it's not an angel that's gone to mechanic school? Yeah. And so we just don't know when God sends those angels it, he, he doesn't put a big name tag on them and say, Angel, from God, they can just come into our lives. And probably more than we, we realize, the angels are so present in our lives, ministering to us in so many different ways, doing so many different things each and every day. And think of all the blessings God just showers upon us every day. The bread that we need for our bodies, figuratively, re- representing all those things that we need, as well as the bread that he gives us for our souls. And think of how God looks at us, too, in view of that that baby who was born in Bethlehem over 2,000 years ago and whose adult body hung on the cross of Calvary and whose soul carried all our guilt and all our sin and who died for our sins, suffering the punishment we deserve and then rose again on the third day to show us that it is all finished, as he said on the cross. Every day now you enjoy the forgiveness of sins. Every day now you have peace with God. Every day now you have the promise that God is with you to bless you and help you. Every day you have the hope that even if God allows things that are hard and that hurt to come into life, He'll make sure that it never gets so bad that you can't go on and that you don't have purpose in life. Every day you have the love of God. Every day you have life that is rich and full and reason to rejoice. Every day you have eternal life waiting for you. And so we go back to that promise of God, do not fear for I am with you. Do not be dismayed for I am your God. I will strengthen you and help you. I will uphold you with my righteous right hand. So we go to the question, how bad can it get? Sometimes real bad. But remember, never so bad that we can't go on because of the mercy and the ministry of God. 
And the peace of God that passes understanding will keep your hearts and your minds through faith in Christ Jesus to life everlasting. Amen.